Welcome to Make a Path Presents. I'm Ronnie Hayes, and we are back with episode three of Stranger Things season two. If you're new here, real quick, we are burning through the episodes. You can watch and check out the review as we go along. I'm probably only going to be able to get to episode four or five tonight, and then tomorrow I will try my best to get at least uh, two or three done. Hopefully, if I can manage, I'll try to get them all done. I'm really trying to do this so that way uh, those who want to binge watch it can actually watch the reviews as they're binge watching it. So let's dive right into this. This episode is called Polywog, and that is because Dustin finds this tadpole-like creature, and he was looking up in reptile books comparing it to a polywog or some shit like that. I don't know. Huge, 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 and obvious E.T. Easter eggs. First off, there's the clear Easter egg visual of E.T in the actual lizard tank and that has a bigger connection because E.T., remember the kid Elliot put out the Reese's candy and E.T. was eating the chocolate candy, uh, the trick-or-treat candy. Well, in this one, you have the three musketeers instead. That's what's fed to this little um, creature. I really hope the creature's not around uh, for too long. I don't know. It's borderline for me. It's getting to the point where it's like, oh, I like this. You know, I do, but it could get silly, and that's what I'm worried about. So far, they're handling it pretty good. Uh, the CGI is not perfection at all. I feel like it will be date, uh, dated and aged. It'll look really aged in a few years, probably as soon as maybe even five years before this series uh, completes. The CGI might even look a little a little dated, but uh, I'm fine with how it looks so far because this is uh, a different type of creature, so it's kind of helping to suspend your disbelief somewhat as you're watching it. So it's not too bad. All right, so anyhow, uh, forgetting the Easter egg stuff, we got... Uh, uh, another vision of, or another flashback, I'm sorry, of Hopper and L. I think I missed something. Either I missed something or they didn't show it, or I feel like I missed it because I don't, it wouldn't make sense why they wouldn't show it now, but uh, L is out in the woods and Hopper leaves uh, the egos and stuff in the box. And then when she goes to check the box, she catches him and it appears that she catches him when he puts the food from season one. So when he came to put the food and then when he walked away, or at least that's what I got out of it. So at the end of season one, when we see him walking away, that's when Elle went and uh, and approached him. What Where I'm confused is, where did the box in the woods come from as far as, how did he know to put food there? You know what I mean? Like, did, did I miss a, if I missed a part, put that down in the comment box. I don't understand how he knew she would look in the box and then keep coming back. That part I must have missed somewhere, but I love that he takes her to the cabin and they have this little montage of them cleaning it up and setting it up. And obviously, even though the montage is quick, we get this feeling that they grow a very strong bond, very close bond, uh, like like a father and daughter. There's some fighting. He's late, you know, repeatedly. He's telling her to wait. It's it's dangerous out there. She's getting fed up and anxious and she's got cabin fever. Uh, is that what they call it? Where you're stuck in one place, <laughs> you know, like uh, stuck, isolated in the cabin and stuff. So uh, he makes it up to her by throwing candy on top of Eggos. So there's definitely some sweet moments here. Uh, but I just feel like the direction they're going with the conflict, it's just going to blow up soon. And there is a scene in the trailer that I, I can't get it out of my head now. And I feel like that might have something to do with um, something to do with their boiling conflict. <laughs> All right. So go over to Bob. Bob is someone that is a supporting role. But I do want to mention him here because usually the boyfriend has a conflicting role like he conflicts with the the children or the parent or i don't know there's there's just some type of conflict there but i do like how this seems like a, a sweet guy his interactions with will especially trying to give him some advice talking about bullying uh, and then he even rebound for a moment there. I'm like, okay, they're landed on real thick when he was talking about um, being bullied. And then he said, and look at me now. I grew up and I got Joyce. I mean, they rebound with the writing. They rebound really well there. So I think for a supporting character, they went a good direction. Instead of making it a, a cliche asshole boyfriend, uh, they went the other direction with Bob. And I think he that's a perfect fit. And then we got more rot in the fields. I love this. They're starting to realize that the rot is spreading not only is it spreading they pulled out a map 
and they realize that it's actually started, it started from the, um, oh my God, I can't think of it. It started from the lab where they were, uh, where they had, oh my God, how can I not remember this? It's the lab where they had L and they're doing the tests and stuff like that. So it's actually spreading out from there. And we see Paul Reiser's character get a little annoyed with uh, Hopper and then Hopper puts him in his place. So we, we, we can tell that Paul Reiser has a little more power than he's letting on. He kind of throws a soft threat at, uh, or a warning shot, you would say, at um, Hopper by being like, wait a minute, you're going to tell me what to do? No. And then you can tell he kind of backs off a little bit and decides to go out and look at the uh, field rot. Next up, we have friction between Steve and Nancy. This right here is the only con so far, I think, other than a little bit of a touch of the CGI. The friction between Steve and Nancy seems like it's cliche, bad habit from Hollywood. Uh, Hollywood constantly says conflict is king. Conflict, conflict, conflict. I think I would have bought them having conflict if she can't deal with this line to Barb's family. This is really, uh, really bringing her down. And if Steve was just, no, let's push past it. Let's keep doing this. We can do it. Yada, yada, yada. And that created the conflict. I think I would have felt a little better than her just getting drunk and saying some stupid shit, to be honest. So yeah, it matters on what direction they go from here but the conflict does feel like unfortunately it's Hollywood bad habit writing of saying okay we don't know what to do yet with these characters but we need to take Nancy and put her with Jonathan Jonathan Moore so let's just put conflict here between her and Steve okay and then we got a camcorder and I am not that old I might look old as shit but when I was actually really little we did have a camcorder we didn't have it for a long I think it came out of the 80s and it was a beast and if you know what a VHS tape is imagine a VHS tape used to go into that type of camcorder the one here was a newer model where you had the smaller tapes and you had to put it in an adapter later on but uh, imagine a big camera so I love that they had they utilized the technology of the 80s and they have this big camcorder and then she goes to plug it in and she has to call him up I remember so many phone calls growing up either telling friends or a girlfriend once or my grandparents or a family member how to connect like a VCR to the TV with the the different color um, cords and like this and this and this nowadays it's easy you got you know HDMI or the friggin shit is built into the damn TV so you got everything digital right there but back in the day you used to have to attach these different color wires and all this other bullshit and I love that that little bit was in there I don't know next up we got the pet one thing I want to say, I covered this a little bit already, but I do love how they utilize the Ghostbusters trap to grab the pet. You know, I they're taking uh, extra effort to keep utilizing these Easter eggs that they bring in. Not only are they utilizing it, but it's set in a time where it doesn't take me out of it. I can picture these kids using their Halloween costume, a trap they, they have for their costume, to trap the pet and take it to school. So uh, that was a nice little touch too. And then we have Eleven, who sees Mike at school and has a little touch of jealousy. Now, she keeps getting irritable and, uh, you know, throwing things, uh, slamming the door with her powers and stuff like that. So we're starting to see a little bit more of um, an irritated and annoyed. And I don't know if that's just her and something she's going through as she's growing up, especially with the, the um, tests and the torture and the, the psychological shit she had to go through with um, her situation. Or if this is just average teenage stuff mixed with isolation, <laughs> you know, being stuck in a cabin the whole damn time and wanting to go see and now she feels like maybe she's missing out on something and then another girl's getting close to Mike, a person that she cares about. She should be there. She should be able to, uh, you know, have a conversation with Mike and live her life, but she can't, so she gets a little pissed off. Next up, we got Mike and the shadow thing that was, was actually visible when his mom, I forgot to mention this, his mom was looking at the tape to see who bullied him, but she saw the shadow shadow on the tape which is strange how he it's kind of like um finding its way into the into the world it's as if it's getting some type of powers from the rot in the pumpkin fields as if it's um almost able to travel between the other dimension and this dimension i might be way off but how else was it on the camcorder or maybe it's something with the electrical it can cross the dimension somehow i don't know that was neat but the very end of it when he stopped he took bob's advice he stopped and he 
said, go away, leave me alone, just go away. And the, the, the fog monster was like, no. <laughs> and it looked like the, the fog monster creature, whatever it was, the, the thing, the entity, it looked like it was going into them, kind of like, um, like, like a, something would go in as like a, using them like a host. I'm kind of afraid with the next episode that it's not going to be Will anymore. I liked Will. I like him a lot. He's one of the saddest, you know, aspects of uh, Stranger Things. He's one of the saddest, you know, most pathetic parts of Stranger Things. And I'm afraid when we watch the next episode, it's not going to be Will. It's going to be like this creature controlling Will. But that's the vibe I got. Maybe they don't go that direction at all where you know it just stopped him and and because the next episode it looks like it's called will the wise maybe it just let him see what he's going to be doing you know as far as the creature and taking over to different areas but i got this vibe where i'm like uh i it feels like in a weird way maybe some of the fog went into will and now it can come out of him in some form we already saw him throw up the slugs and stuff so can it come out now and live in this world in some type of form i don't know I don't know. That part, I'm going to dive into the next episode because I really want to get one more done at least uh, for tonight. I'm I'm loving it. I am loving Stranger Things so far, Season 2, and I want to dive right back into this. So, leave your thoughts, theories, opinions, predictions, suggestions, you name it, down in that comment box. I'm done talking. It's your turn.